Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and it's great to be with you guys. I'm honored to serve under our senior pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. If you guys haven't been here long, you've probably figured out this is a great place to call your church home. Very loving place, very welcoming place. And it's a, we're all about a real God for real people, which I'm a real people, and I know you are too, right? So, hey, we're continuing our series today called Summer of Joy. We have been going through the book of Philippians, verse by verse. There's a book written by Paul from a prison cell, and it's called the Book of Joy, which is crazy because he wrote the book about joy while he was in a prison cell. So the message is that you can find joy no matter what's going on around you. Joy starts with what's happening inside your heart. And we're going to talk about something today that it's it's kind of a lofty concept, but I'm hoping to make it really practical for you because I think it may be one of the most important messages in the book of Philippians. But before we do that, I want to tell you guys about my dark and sordid past. I'm going to tell you about my testimony of my days before Jesus. Y'all ready for this? Okay. So when I was four years old, I accepted Jesus. My dad was a pastor. So uh, I grew up with a pastor as a father. Now, I'll tell you this straight up. My dad is a man who's most like Jesus who I know. So I was given an unfair advantage in this life. I have a a father who is an incredibly godly man, and he deep, he's instilled within me very early on a deep sense of morality and conscience. And uh, in fact, so much so that when I was four years old, we went to a grocery store one time and I stole a pack of gum. I'm telling you, my life of crime started right there. I stuck it in my pocket and I left. But I got home and I felt so guilty about that 25 cent pack of winter fresh gum. It was blue, blue pack. And I went to dad, I was like, dad, I stole this. And he's like, well, we're going to go back to the store. So we went back to the store and I had to pay the cash. I don't think the cashier even cared, but I was like, I stole this gum. He's like, all right, whatever, man. So much conviction. So I'm living my life trying to follow Jesus. I'm going to Sunday school every week. I mean, we were there every time the doors were open. Well, when I was 12, I bought a cassette tape by a guy named MC Hammer. Y'all remember MC Hammer? Too legit, too legit to quit. Hey, hey. And I went and I listened to the lyrics and I remember something like a guilt came over me. I'm like, this isn't very Christian lyrics. And I went to dad and I'm like, dad, I don't think I should be listening to this music. And he's like, all right, well, we can return the, the cassette tape. So I didn't have a tape player that could actually rewind tapes. So I had to use a pencil. Remember that? Yeah, anyway, some of you are like, what is he talking about? So we took the tape back and I got the money back, but I felt so convicted about only listening to Christian music. Well, when I was 16, 17, 18, um, you know, I'm a a raging hormone teenager and I was just so like thinking about girls all the time. And I was like, I got to keep myself under control. I can't sin here. And uh, so I I found this group and I, I decided I wanted to become a Franciscan monk because I said, I saw that they had a, they had a rule. You, you vow to poverty, chastity, and obedience. And I was like, sweet. Well, poverty's easy because I don't have any money anyways. <laughs> obedience, I could probably do that. But chastity, I'm like, that'll keep me from lusting over girls. So I started hanging out with the Franciscans. And they were wonderful, wonderful people. But I also discovered, man, I really like women. So they're like, well, you can't get married if you're going to be a Franciscan. I'm like, oh, man, I'm only 18. This is a big commitment for life, you know? And And then I also couldn't get past this thing. Like, I know a lot of y'all are former Catholics or still Catholics, but I just couldn't get past the Mary thing. I just, I, you know, based on my upbringing, I was like, I can't, I can't buy into the Mary thing, worshiping Mary. So the Franciscans were like, that's kind of a deal breaker. You're out, bro. So I was like, duh. So my story is basically this. I accepted Christ in an early age and I never, ever ran from the faith. I never went through a rebellious stage. My testimony is boring. Now, some of you, you can relate to this. And, you know, we, those of us who have a boring testimony, we look at people who have this radical transformation story, like Pastor Marcus or something. You're like, man, I wish I had a story like that. That'd be so awesome to tell people how bad I was and then God saved me, right? But those of you who have a story like that are looking at me and going, dang, I wish I had that story. Because all the pain that that testimony 
cause. Thank God that he delivered me, but it would have been a lot nicer to not have to go through all of that. So we've all got these, these tor- stories and testimonies. The problem with my testimony is this. I have been hanging out for so long in the church and doing this faith thing. I mean, just to give you an example of my upbringing. To graduate high school, I had to quote the entire book of Philippians exactly before I could graduate. And that's not saying that to brag. I'm just saying I'm a victim, right? Look how bad things were for me. No, <laughs> I had to memorize the book of Philippians and they took off a half a point for every word I missed. Yeah, crazy, right? My graduating from high school depended on me memorizing scripture. Now, I'm super grateful for that now, because if you guys haven't noticed, I know a lot of the Bible. Uh, most of it was shoved into my brain. I had to learn it. So, but I'm grateful for it. Uh, but what the, the consequence of that is for me, I've been gone through phases of life where, where, where this faith we believe in has gotten kind of boring for me. It's just gotten kind of boring. And I went through one of those about five years ago. Now, I didn't question anything I believed. I, was, I always believed this. I knew Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But about five years ago, I was like, I feel like this faith is kind of boring for me. But right about that same time, I, something hit me, and I came down with this deep, deep sense of anxiety that I was about to die. I mean, I woke up, and I just knew. I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I was always panicked about it. I asked my wife. My poor wife tolerated this for years. I had this deep sense that I was going to die. And then about three years ago on my birthday, I think it was my 43rd birthday, I woke up and I heard this voice in my head that said, this is your last year of your life. And I remember it being so jolting to me. I was just, it, it, it compounded this anxiety I already had that I was going to die. And uh, I really thought it was God. I mean, now listen, and this may be encouraging to some of you, but I've been doing this for 40 something years. And uh, sometimes you hear stuff and you think it's God, but it's not God. Which is why it's really important to have people around you that you can share what you think you're hearing from the Lord and then say, I'm not so sure that's God. I actually told Pastor Marcus. And this is what he said to me. He said, I don't think you're going to die. I think you're just going to die to what used to be, to the old way of seeing things. And Pastor Marcus was dead on. He was dead on because I'll tell you this. It was during the last five years that the Bible has come alive to me and my relationship with God has come alive to me in a way I never could have imagined. Like, I mean, I am... I am so excited about this. You guys have heard me joke oftentimes that when I get up here and speak, it's great if you guys learn something from it, but I'm way more concerned about my growth than your growth (laughs) because if I keep growing, in theory, I can project onto you what I'm learning as I grow, right? But I'm in this season where the Bible has come alive to me, but it all came at the hands of that weird, difficult season where I was just certain I was going to die. And I'm convinced that our greatest opportunities for growth come in those moments in life where we feel like we're facing death. Not just physical death, but every one of you, you've got an experience in your life where you thought it was over. Some of you, it happened after the divorce and you just, your world came crumbling around and you go, it's over. The world is over. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to love again. I'm so hurt and destroyed inside. I don't know if I can love again. I don't even know if I'm lovable again. Maybe, maybe I'm, I mean, maybe it was, you know, maybe your second or third divorce and you're, you're starting to think in your mind, this is, life is over. I'm just not, apparently I'm not lovable. Some of you, man, it came after you lost that job and you just felt this deep sense within you that, man, you like, everything was done. Like that you're like, I don't know what else I can do other than this. And I've lost my job in this career field. Who am I apart from that? I've talked to mothers who after their kids leave the house. They feel like their life is over because for the last 20, 25 years, everything they've had has been poured into being a mother. And all of a sudden the kids are like, peace out, mom, boom. And you're going, it's over. Like what my purpose for living was over. We've all got these things in life where we come to them and we're certain life is over. For some of you as a diagnosis, the doctor said, you're done. There's no cure for this, but yet you're still here today. And you're going, wow, I'm still here. We all come to this place where we think life is over, like we're going to die. And I'm convinced that one of the most transformative times in our life is when we come face to face with a death and we have a decision to make. We're looking at what Paul says about this today. Last week, Pastor Marcus talked about Paul, how he goes through this resume and he's got this great resume. He's like, guys, look, I had all the education. I had the, I mean, I was highly respected, but all that stuff I had, I consider that as like nothing compared to knowing Jesus Christ. And this is what he goes on to say. This is where we pick up the verse today. He says, I want to know Christ. 
Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, as you're reading through your Bible, there's, most of the Bibles have a divider line there. They've got a new subheading right after that line. But there, those subheadings, Paul didn't put those in. The translators did. So as you're reading it, you want to read your Bible always as a constant stream of thought. So this next part is directly connected to the first part. If you're reading it, though, you'd think, ah, it's a separate thought. It's the same thought. And he says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Now, this is encouraging because here's Paul who wrote the Bible and he's saying, guys, I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. And some of you are going, man, I just, when am I going to arrive? Well, Paul's saying, you probably aren't going to get there in this life and that's okay. The goal is this. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to look today specifically at this idea that the way we achieve what God is accomplishing in our life is through suffering. And I'm going to define suffering really simply. Suffering is any time you're out of control of a situation. You think about an illness. You're out of control of that in many ways. You think about having a three-year-old. Suffering. You're out of control in many ways. It's like, ah! And it's in those moments of suffering where we, we actually feel like a part of us is dying, which if you've had kids or you've, anything you've done, there's a moment where you feel like part of you is dying and you're so connected to it that, that to lose it, you go, man, if I lose this, uh, it's over. And what most of us do, we end up, I think, clinging to what the old thing was and trying to bring it back to life. Or it's like, if I just do a little CPR, I can bring this old way back. But the goal is to always be pressing on in the faith. But in order to press on, you have to be willing to let go of what was to embrace the new thing that God has for you. But oftentimes, letting go of what was feels like death. So there's this guy named Gregory of Nyssa. He lived about 1,500 years ago. And he described this, what Paul is talking about in this passage is called epictasis. And it means an eternal stretching and straining toward God. And I think that is what the life of faith is. It's constantly being stretched to more and more of what God says is within you. There's this verse where Paul says in Corinthians, he says, if we're out of our mind, as some of you think we are, it's because Christ's love compels us. And that, that, he, that Greek word compels us, suneko. And it's a weird word because in some translations in the NIV, it says Christ's love constrains us, which sounds like it holds you back. But in other translations, like the ESV, it says Christ's love compels us or pushes us forward. And you go, well, that's contradictory. No, it's not contradictory. What that Greek word literally means is this power comes around you and squeezes you to push you out to become all that you can be. And some of you can relate to this because even some of you in your darkest moment, you hit rock bottom with that addiction and you said to yourself, I know I'm better than this. Now, the addiction's taking hold of you and you're trying to get free from it. But there's something within any of us that have the Spirit of God within us. It's God's love pushing us out to become all we could be that says, I know there's more in me than this. And some of you have been very successful in life. And people are looking at you and go, man, you got it made. And you're like, yeah, but I know there's more in me than this. I know I've got more than this. Talk to mothers all the time. They're like, man, I love being a mother, but I know there's more in me than this. And I feel guilty that I'm not just content just being a mother. This thing within you that's pushing you out, it's God's love. It's, it's like literally, like I believe, a holy ambition pushing you to be more. But the way we get to more in this life is completely counterintuitive. In fact, if you walk away from nothing else from this message today, here's the one thing I want you to walk away with, okay? The goal is always to be pressing on towards what God has for us. But in God's kingdom, down is the way up. He's always going to ask you to get lower before he raises you up. Peter says this. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in the right time, he will lift you up. And when he lifts you up, by his power, you ain't coming back down. But it requires the willingness to go down and let die that thing you were dying, you, you were holding on to, and then trusting that eventually, if you surrender it to him, he can bring it back to life in a more glorious form. And I believe that one of the functions of religion, 
belief that we have is to teach us how to die before we die so that we can truly live. And I believe that that is what I would call God's power pattern. And Jesus himself, he lived this out. He said this, the hour has come for the son of man, that was Jesus, what he called himself, to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for the eternal life. Now, we've heard this passage always in the context of if you accept Jesus, you'll have eternal life with him after you die. But Jesus is talking about something way bigger than this. In fact, the more I read the Gospels and the Bible, the more I realize there are infinite layers of truth to everything in the Bible. I've been reading it, like I said, for over 40 years, and I'm reading it now in a way that's just blowing my mind. I'm going, this is ultimate, absolute depth of reality and truth, and I never saw it before. I thought I got it, but I didn't get it. There's, you'll never get to the bottom of all of the truth in the Scripture. Throughout your life, as you're moving forward in Christ— moving up that hill, pressing on, he's going to reveal more and more and more truth to you. And I think what Jesus is saying here is he's like, guys, if you really want to live, you've got to be willing to die. In fact, in one verse, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, an instrument of torture and suffering, and follow me. And the reality is that the only way we grow in the faith is through an experience of great suffering or an experience of great love. And what is the cross? Great love and great suffering all in one icon and one image. That's why the cross is so powerful. Jesus says, through my love and my suffering, I'm showing you the way to live. And throughout our lives, I believe we have to face a series of deaths in order to face life. In fact, uh, uh, this is what the curve looks like. Life, then death, and then resurrection life but you first have to be willing to die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said it this way. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And that's so contrary to the way the world thinks. The way we're taught is if you want to go up, you push and you push to go up. But God says, no, if you want to go up, you humble yourself and go down and then let me be the one who pushes you to where you, all the heights of where you can be. So I want to get real practical. And look at what are some areas, because it's an ethereal, an ethereal concept, but what are some areas that we have to die to and we have to let go of and surrender to God in order that he can bring resurrection life from it? For some of it, for some of us in here in this room, the thing we need to die to is our need to be right all the time. Some of us, you just, you've got to be right. Your, your ego is so fragile that to admit you're wrong would be like death to you. And everybody around you knows you're wrong. And they may, you may have, they may have proven scientifically that you're wrong. But you're still going to die on that hill. You're going, no, but I'm right about this. Yeah, but you're wrong about 95% of everything else. Yeah, but I'm right. Get over yourself, man. You know what that is? That's pride. And everybody knows you're wrong. And you wonder why people are, you know, you don't have the friendships you used to have. Maybe it's because you always got to be right. And sometimes... You got to decide if you want to be right or in right relationship. And that means you humble yourself and acknowledge, yeah, I, I got that one wrong. Sometimes you need to humble yourself before your kids and acknowledge, dad got it wrong. Well, my, my dad never did that for me. Well, how's your relationship with your dad? One of the most humbling things to do is admit to your kids when you messed it up. Some of you need to die to that so that God can resurrect it and make you into all he wants you to be. For others, what you need to die to is you need to die to your need to always be the one who's rescuing everyone. You pride yourself in how you put your needs aside and you sacrifice for others. But then you're drowning and God sends people to you to rescue you. And you're like, no, no, no. I'm the one that rescues people. And you push them away. And then you become resentful going, I'm always there for everybody else, but nobody's there for me. <laughs> you need to get over it. You can't save the world. Somebody already did. Jesus. And through his power, he may use you as a vessel to do that, but you got to get over yourself and realize you're not the one that's going to save everybody. And there comes a time where you need to let God save you through other people and get over your pride. 
For others of you, you need to die to this feeling within you that if you aren't accomplishing and achieving and doing stuff, you're of no value to the world. And you just stay busy just because it makes you feel like you've got some validation. But really, you're just staying busy doing stuff that's really not moving the ball down the field. It's just keeping you busy and you're feeling validated. And this is why COVID was so hard on so many people. We live in an achiever-based culture. And for many of us, we're driven by this, I got to achieve, I got to achieve. And then we've shut down the world. And a lot of people are like, I'm worthless. I'm worthless because I can't achieve. And I think that was a tremendous opportunity for God to show a lot of us that your value doesn't come from what you achieve or accomplish or how busy you stay. Your value comes from who God says you are. Others of you, what you need to die to is your obsession with being unique and special. So many of us, well, nobody understands my pain. What I'm going through, it's unique. I'm special. And people try and help you, and you're like, you don't understand my pain. I am a, I am a victim beyond victims. Nobody understands my pain. And that becomes a source of identity and pride for you. But what it does is it actually creates isolation. And your desire to be unique and special. Listen, you are special. Jesus loves you like he loves everybody else. <laughs> and you need to get over it and realize that God has placed people in your life, that they understand what you're going through. It's not the same, but it's close enough to humble yourself. For others, what you need to die to is your, your unwillingness to go all in until you completely understand it. And you go, well, I won't commit until I understand it. Listen, if it required full understanding to be in the faith, I wouldn't be in the faith because there's like 10,000 things about our faith I still don't understand. But I know I'm right where I need to be and I know that God's going to reveal it to me at the right time. So I commit to being humble and saying, I'm not going to understand everything and I'm not going to limit myself to my understanding. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge Him and He will direct my path. For others, the thing you need to die to is the fear that keeps you from moving forward and your desire for safety and security. So many people, the reason they don't move forward is because they go, I got to have a backup plan for my backup plan for my backup plan. And you're obsessed with having everything secure and safe before you'll move forward. And there is no guarantee of that in the faith. In fact, if everything is safe and secure, you don't need faith. Faith requires moving forward in your fear and saying, God, I'm not going to let fear control me. I'm going to let faith control me. And faith says, whatever comes from this decision, even if I fall flat on my face or even if I die, I know that you're the one that's going to sustain me. And maybe what you need to let go of is you need to die to your need to have everything safe and outlined for you before you move forward. Others, you need to die to your feeling that you always have to stay happy. I'm a happy person. And whenever you're not happy, you feel like something's wrong with you. Let me tell you this. We aren't called to be happy. We're called to have joy. And joy comes from a deep place. Happy is surface level. But if you're waiting on, if you're depending on being happy to have life you want, there are going to be some things in life that just aren't happy. Death of a loved one, not a happy thing. You, what's wrong with me? Nothing. It's the human experience. You don't have to be happy but you're called to joy in the middle of that. And if you're waiting on happiness, on having this great affect all the time, you're going to feel like a failure when you don't have that happiness. And maybe the reason God's put you through such a dark time recently, he didn't do it, but I believe he allows us to go through these things, is because he wants you to die to your need to be happy and instead come to resurrection life in joy. For others like me, we've got to die to our need to control everything. That's me. I'm a total control freak. I am a total control freak. And I think part of the reason I've been going through this fear of death thing is because as I get older, I realize I can't control that. Ultimately, my life is in God's hands. He knows the number of my days. And I can fight and kick and beg all I want. There's a weird story in the Bible, though, where God actually extends a dude's life because he asks for it. But you got to trust that, man, God is the one who's sovereign and he's in control. And you got to stop trying to control everything because it's making you and everybody else around you miserable. And then some of you, the thing you need to die to is your avoidance of conflict at all cost. You go, I'm a peacemaker. But listen, sometimes peace comes at the hands of conflict. And you've got to be willing to stand up and speak up for yourself. Because what you're actually, you can, you, look, you can pay it now or you can pay it later, but it's always cheaper to pay it now. And some of you are waiting until the problem gets so big that you're going to confront it when it's big enough, but you need to actually nip it in the bud right now and have the conversation. 
but you're terrified of what's going to happen. And I'm telling you this, if you'll be willing to surrender yourself and humble yourself and say, God, I don't want this confrontation, but I need to have this confrontation. And as you're dying to yourself, everything inside of you is going to feel like you're dying because it feels like you're creating havoc instead of peace. You can trust that if you do it right and trust God to lead you, he's going to bring it back to life in a more glorious form. The pattern is always this, guys. Life, death, resurrection life. But first you have to be really comfortable with dying to those little deaths throughout your life. And as you're willing to let go over and over and over again, you rise higher and higher and higher. And just when you think you're there, he'll be like, I got something else I need you to let go of. And you'll go, ah, again, I'm tired of all this learning. He said, yeah, epictosis, perpetual ascent, We're constantly moving towards the goal of being more like Christ. And that is how he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are working in us to will and to act according to your good pleasure. We thank you, Lord, that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. The path of the righteous, like the light of dawn, shines brighter and brighter and brighter. So I, every one of us this morning, we know we heard what it is we need to surrender. So I pray, Lord, this morning, you would empower us to humble ourselves and go low so you can take us high. Die to that thing, trusting that you are the one who will bring it back to life if it needs to be brought back to life. And if it doesn't, we thank you, Lord, that you took it out of our life. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Christ, I'm gonna give you a chance in just a second. We're gonna say a prayer. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, you're on the first step of the path to becoming more like Jesus. He's going to forgive you of your sins, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, and set you up with him in the kingdom of light. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way, and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you back behind that, under that do it again sign. You guys, I pray you'll have a great week dying to yourself so that you can be set free in resurrection life. Be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.